I have no financial ties to any of the companies, devices, machines, products we're going to talk about today. I'm taking no money from anyone. So if you hear an opinion, it's my personal opinion, and it's not because I'm a paid spokesperson. All right, so it brings us back to what we're going to talk about, the missing link in the chain of survival. AHA put out the chain of survival, early access, early CPR, defibrillation, early ACLS, and have pretty much left out the early post return of spontaneous circulation care. So we're going to add to that chain. And the first thing we'll talk about adding to that chain is hypothermia. So let's talk about the nuts and bolts. Let's talk about how you're actually going to get induced hypothermia to happen. All right, let's take Sam here. And this is not his real name. It's not his real picture. But the case is real. Sam was about 50 years old. He was a lawyer, but not a malpractice lawyer, so we didn't make him immediate DNR at the scene. And, and Sam was in his office. He was having a heart attack, um, or at least he thought he was, and he actually went into cardiac arrest right in front of his office workers. Now, one of his friends in the office um, didn't know CPR, but had heard that if you bang on the chest hard enough, it's a good thing. And Thank God they did, because what we're finding out now is that that compression-only CPR is actually a great thing. And if you didn't do any of the mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilations, there's really no, no downside to that. If you did your compressions quick enough, that's the most important thing. So by the time the ambulance got there, um, they found him to be in ventricular fibrillation. And they shocked him, and he got a pulse back and came into the emergency department at Elmhurst. And he was a little hypotensive. He got some fluids. He got put on a vasopressor. And his, he stabilized. His heart rate was OK. His blood pressure was OK. But he was still comatose. Um, he would withdraw to pain, wasn't open in his eyes. And we decided we induce hypothermia. All right. So the first thing I have my residents do when they have a case like this is to print out our protocol. And no matter how many times you've done this, it's good to have a, a road map. So in my packet that is in the handout, you have my most current protocol. And you, don't, you can look at it now or not, look at it later, either way. But the reason I have the slide like this is the protocol keeps changing. I, so it's, it's definitely a fluid act. And, and part of that is because we want to start off very tight in who we put into the protocol to get some success stories. And then we broadened our inclusion criteria. Part of it is we just keep finding out better and better ways to do it. So this is the protocol. As of yesterday, if you talk to me next week, it might change again. So the first question you ask is, who do you do it on? Who's the appropriate candidate for induced hypothermia after cardiac arrest? And I'll give you the easy answer. The easy answer is everyone. Everyone who's had a cardiac arrest, I feel, is appropriate for this therapy. Um, we have a very inclusive protocol at this point, but I have to give you, you know, some provisos to that. The evidence Bernard Hock, a trial I told you about, supports VFib and pulseless VTAC. That's where the level one evidence is. That's where the randomized controlled trials are. There's been subsequent trials. Asystole is starting to show the same relative risk reduction, obviously not the same overall mortality because the rhythms are just more dismal, but the same relative risk reduction. The data is out there. It's not as robust. I would tell you it's very difficult to figure out what rhythm a patient's in sometimes, you'll get very varied stories. We found that when we first started. It might be easier for when you folks develop a protocol to just include all comers, PEA, asystole, VFib, pulses, VTAC. All right. The answer when I'm asked who should we do it on is everyone you would send to an ICU. So if you have a 95-year-old patient, their family's thinking about DNR, well, that's a patient I'm probably not going to want to do aggressive therapies of any sort on. I'm going to probably do palliation. I'm going to make them comfortable. They're not going to go to an ICU. They're not the proper, uh, proper candidate for induced hypothermia. But even if you have an 80-year-old who the family says, no, they were functional. They were talking to their grandkids. They had a life before all this. And I deem them an appropriate ICU candidate. If I'm going to send them up to the ICU, I might as well induce hypothermia on them. So we have a very broad inclusion. Now, the reason for that at my center is, A, hypothermia doesn't cost me anything. It costs me two bags of normal saline and the cooling blankets we already have in the hospital, which are about $50 a set. So there's really no downside from the monetary perspective for me 
Now, if you folks decide to go to intravascular catheters, and we'll talk about those in a few minutes, about 1,500 a pop, Maybe for you, it's going to be a little bit more of a hardship to include a whole bunch of patients that may or may not benefit. But for me, the money is not a downside at all. It costs about, I don't know, $55 to induce hypothermia. The number of A-line kits my interns go through establishing the A-line is far more expensive than the hypothermia. And then the big question is, do you need more nursing staff in order to do it? And for me, the answer is no. We run an ED critical care unit in my ED. We already have two nurse, uh, one nurse to every two patients. We already have a dedicated attending. We already have dedicated residents taking care of all my ED critical care patients. I don't need any extra staffing to do a hypothermia case. So for me, I don't have to call in extra nurses. The nurses I have are spectacular. They're already ready for this. The other issue on this is if you're taking cardiac arrest patients in your ED, these folks are really, really sick. There's few patients sicker than a post-cardiac arrest patient. So if you don't have the nursing staffing already to do induced hypothermia, you have to ask yourself, do you have the nursing staffing to take care of cardiac arrest patients in the ED without hypothermia? So you definitely need your nurses on board. For us, it doesn't cost any additional nursing to come down to do it. We have the nurses already. So again, it's another reason I could induce hypothermia on pretty much everyone who comes through the door. So I go back to who do I induce hypothermia on? Who do I recommend? Who do the folks that are researching hypothermia recommend? Pretty much everyone. Um, here's a patient probably was not the right candidate for induced hypothermia. Uh, I think they gave it a shot with the ice surrounding it, but that's not the best candidate. All right. So here's what our inclusion and exclusion criteria look like. You've got to be post-cardiac arrest, but any rhythm. You have to have return of spontaneous circulation within 30 minutes of EMS arriving. We found it impossible to figure out when the code started, so we've made it 30 minutes from EMS arrival. If it's in hospital, it's from when the code team arrives. Time now, less than six hours from return of spontaneous circulation, which means you can still do this even if they've taken a trip to the cath lab and the interventionalists are not comfortable with hypothermia being on board. We'll talk about that more as well. But you have, you have some time, but the sooner the better. You have to be comatose. And for us, we've expanded to the point where that just means you have a motor Glasgow coma score of less than six. You're not following commands. That's basically what we define as comatose. We were a lot tighter when we started, and this is what we've expanded to. And then you could be on one vasopressor, you have to have a map of greater than 65. If you're requiring multiple vasopressors, you're probably too unstable. Exclusion criteria. Again, DNR, poor baseline status, terminal disease. If you have active bleeding or intracranial bleeding, we'll exclude you. Traumatic arrest is a whole different disorder. We don't include them. Cryoglobulinemia, because the cold makes the cryoglobulinemia worse. Pregnancy relative, recent major surgery relative. And we've had very bad results in cooling um, severe sepsis patients. They need their cardiac output so much that even a little bit taken away from them has not worked out well. So we're not cooling septic arrests anymore. We do a brief neuro exam. It's basically just Glasgow coma and brainstem reflexes just to document before we start. And then we're ready to induce hypothermia. Hypothermia has three stages. There's induction, which means getting them to temperature. There's maintenance, which means keeping them at temperature. And then after about 24 hours, there's rewarming. Most of what you're going to be doing in the emergency department is induction and some maintenance until they get an ICU bed. Now, the thing about induction is rapid induction saves patient brain. Um, they're doing some studies at Penn. The preliminary literature looks like for every 15 minutes it takes to get to gold temp, you do worse neurologically. So the, rap the more rapidly you induce, the more brain you save. But if that wasn't enough, Rapid induction saves your brain because all of the big problems with hypothermia are not during maintenance. Once the patient gets the goal temp, once they're around 33 degrees, they're kind of easy to keep there. They don't shiver anymore. The shivering reflex stops. Their metabolic shifts stop. So the unstable time of hypothermia is getting them to temperature, the induction. Once they're there, they're a lot easier to deal with. Now, as a result of that, 
the more rapidly you get them there, the easier it is for you. For all these reasons, I recommend inducing with ice saline. And it's just refrigerator temperature saline. It just sits there waiting for you in your med fridge. I even recommend if you buy an endovascular device, you know, the most potent uh, gadget you could buy to still do your induction with ice saline. There's nothing quicker. Now, you're going to hear about if you go to any of these vendor fairs, this device, this immersive bath system, it's basically like a bathtub that inflates around the patient and it bathes them in ice water. I don't understand the idea of this device. It doesn't make sense to me. The device doesn't do maintenance. It's only there for induction. So again, induced by saline because it's cheap, it's easy, and it's so very workable. Now, the complaint I hear is you induce them with ice saline, you're going to flood their lungs. You're going to put the patient in pulmonary edema. It doesn't happen. And the reasons it, it does not happen are, first of all, hypothermia induces diuresis. These patients pee like racehorses. And you, you know if you've been out on a cold day what happens to your urinary tract. Well, it's the same thing for these patients. So they're peeing out more fluid. You actually need to be replacing their volume losses. Beyond that, once you resuscitate a patient from cardiac arrest, they basically look like septic patients. They have a massive SERS response, an inflammatory response, and they vasodilate just like your septic patients. They need to have their tank filled. Even if you weren't doing induced hypothermia, you'd still want to give them plenty of saline to fill that tank, just like a septic patient, so they don't get pulmonary edema. And the studies are in your handout. The studies of this have not borne out. The CVP doesn't go up, the pulmonary artery pressure doesn't go up, and they don't have signs of pulmonary edema on their x-rays. All right, you're gonna place them on temp monitoring. For us, we used to use uh, rectal probes. We now use esophageal probes. I'll tell you why in a few slides from now. So we, we just drop down an esophageal probe. It goes down just like an NG tube, and it hooks up to our machine. If you can't place an esophageal probe or you're uncomfortable with it, Rectal will still work. Um, it's a little messier. It's a little more uncomfortable for the nurses and the doctors. All right, and then you're gonna place them on a maintenance device, and it doesn't matter what it is. Our maintenance device is a blanket control machine. They were in the hospital when I started. They were using them because the patients would get febrile. They decide they'd wanna cool them down. They had the blanket control machines. It was all there. It hooks up to a rectal esophageal probe. It hooks up to two blankets, and that's it. They cost me nothing. The machines were all over our house, so it was easy. The cheapest, oldest machine is probably from the 1970s, and they work fine. These are not complicated pieces of equipment. They're just a cold water pump and a temperature probe. That's all they are. And for that, you know, you have your esophageal or rectal probe in, and it just clicks in that machine. The machine tells you the patient's temperature. So you're going to place them on this maintenance device, both so that they're ready to maintain and so you get the temperature monitoring in real time. At this point, before you even start doing the hypothermia, you're going to sedate the patient. And the reason for that is twofold. First of all, in animal trials, if you did induce hypothermia, the neurologic benefits were there. It looked great. As soon as you let these rabbits, in this case, um, get the induced hypothermia without sedation on board, all the effects disappeared. All the beneficial effects were gone. You have to keep these patients sedated or else they go so crazy that their brain metabolism goes up, you've obviated the hypothermia. Now, even if the patient is comatose, even if their GCS is three, they basically have the mental status of a rock right now, still put them on opioids. And the reason for that is A, they might be having stuff going on you're not seeing, and B, it's gonna prevent shivering. And we'll talk about shivering in a moment. But no matter what, my patient gets at the very least a fentanyl drip at around 50 mics. And then I'll titrate that up as need be for patient condition. And if they are um, showing signs of under sedation, then they'll get a, either a benzodiazepine or probably preferably in this case propofol if you guys have it. So sedation no matter what, just a little bit, and if they're showing you signs of under sedation, then knock it up until they're fully sedated. We don't paralyze, all right? When we first started hypothermia, we were paralyzing just so people could get experience with it. There's no need for it. If you use the medications I'm gonna show you, um, the shivering effect will be blunted and you could then actually have exam on your patient. You'll know if they're seizing, you'll know if they're waking up, you'll know if they're under sedated. If you paralyze them, all that's gone. So it's unnecessary. All right. So you have them on the temp monitor and you have your fentanyl drip going, you reach into your med fridge, you grab a 500cc bag of saline and you're gonna administer it. Now, the studies all used 
30 cc's per kg. That was the study protocol. And you could do that. You'd be right in keeping with the evidence, and that would be fine. I, through my patient data and looking at the studies that are already uh, in existence, derived this formula. You take the patient's initial temperature, and this, everything's in your hand, Decas. You take the patient's initial temperature, you subtract from 30, uh, 34 from that, that's your goal temp, that's where you want to get them with the saline. And whatever that number is, you multiply it by 15 cc's per kg. So for instance, if I was at 36, and I wanted to get to 34, that would be 36 minus 34 is 2 times 15 cc's per kg, 30 cc's per kg. If you don't want to do any math, no problem. It's about a liter per degree Celsius you want to drop. So for every liter you give an average 70 kilogram patient, they're going to drop about a degree Celsius. So if they're at 36, you want to get to 34, you give them about two liters I say. Right. It's got to go in quick. We say minimum 100 cc's a minute. And if you've ever put fluid in a patient quickly, like one of your trauma patients, you know it's not going to happen no matter how big your IV catheter is unless that bag's under pressure. So pressure bags will work. We use a level one. Do you guys have a level one for your trauma cases? OK, so the level one's great. Just don't put it through the actual heating circuit of the level one. That doesn't work so well. You just use the actual pressure bag component. And it's no better than a pressure bag, except it keeps that constant pressure on. When you're using pressure bags, as the bag empties out, the pressure disappears. The level one keeps it constant. So we're just bringing it in there just for its pressure bag. And that will put fluid in at at least 100 cc's per minute. If you do it this way, you get about a degree every uh, 10 minutes. And that's better than any other device out there for induction. So 100 cc's a minute, that means about a liter takes 10 minutes. About a liter is 1 degree Celsius. You get about 1 degree Celsius every 10 minutes. Now, because this formula I gave you has not been validated, this is just from our retrospective um, patient set, I don't want you giving more than 30 cc's per kg up front because I don't want you using an undalidated formula. So you could you give less if you, my formula tells you less, but please don't give more. What you do is you give the max 30 cc's per kg, and then you wait for them to equivalent to that. And then if you need to give more, you give more. Now, what are you waiting for? This is probably the most important thing you can take home from this lecture because I haven't seen it anywhere else. And it really screwed us up when we first started. We, uh, we were cooling patients, and they'd be at 35, so I'd give 500 cc's of saline. And they'd be at 35, so I'd give another 500 cc's. And then they'd be at 35, so I'd give another 500 cc's. And then they'd be at 34.9, so I'd give another 500 cc's of saline. And, you know, maybe like 20 minutes later, you'd look at the machine, and all of a sudden they're at 31 degrees. And we couldn't figure out what the hell was going on. It was driving us nuts. We actually, on a former um, iteration of this protocol, said stop infusing normal saline at 35.5 and the patient will drift down. This was our caveman response to an observation that no one was explaining to us. And it worked. We did fine with that. We made people stop at 35.5 and they'd wind up right around 33.5, 34. And it was working, but it made me annoyed because I didn't understand what was going on. Then. Case Polderman, who is probably the world's master of this, he practices in Northern Europe, um, put out a paper that's still um, in press. It'll be out very soon. And he talks about this uh, phenomenon called probe lag. And probe lag is the idea that what your temperature probe is showing you is not really where the patient's at. Now, when I first learned induced hypothermia um, during my critical care fellowship, we were using pulmonary artery catheters as our temperature monitor. So we would just hook the pulmonary artery catheter up into the machine, and that was where we got our temps. So I never saw a probe lag, because if you have an intravascular catheter, what you see is exactly what the patient's at. No probe lag. On the other hand, all the other devices have a period of time that they have to equilibrate until they show you the real temp. So we were using rectal probes. The number you see from a rectal probe will not equal the patient's core for about 15 minutes. So when I was giving saline at the guy who was 35, he wasn't 35. He was probably 34.2. And then I give another 500 cc's. He'd probably be 33.8. But the probe still read 35. So it takes about 15 minutes for probe lag to uh, finish up. Now, bladder probe, which many ICUs consider the standard of care, and they're great for maintaining 
is actually even longer, 20 to 30 minutes. You're not going to see a real temperature on your patient for 20 to 30 minutes. So for me, when I actually understood this concept, we were able to change the protocol to real-time monitoring. And now an esophageal probe, which is what we use, is a five-minute lag. So basically, I could give my 30 cc's per kg max, wait five minutes, and then if I am still not attempt, just give more at that point. So probe lag is a big issue. Aside from these four sites, the others, tympanic, um, oral, they are not acceptable for monitoring these patients. And you really need a continuous device. It's not okay to just do an intermittent rectal temperature. All right. So we wait out the probe lag after we've given max 30 cc's per kg. And then if they need more, we'll just give 250 to 500 cc aliquots of the isaline until we get them below 34. So give more isaline as necessary. All right. Now, one of the biggest issues you're going to deal with during the induction is shivering. These patients will shiver because you're making them cold. And if they shiver, you ruin all the benefits of hypothermia because shivering is a hypermetabolic state. And what you're trying to do is chill out all their metabolism, their brain metabolism, their possibly injured heart metabolism. So you're obviating the benefits. So you have to keep them from shivering. The first thing you do is you assess whether they are or not. And this uh, Stefan Mayer, probably New York's expert on hypothermia, um, developed this scale. Zero, you look at them, they're not shivering. A, a shivering scale of one, you might not even see it. But if you put your hands on their neck or their, uh, or their thorax, you'll feel a little bit of shivering. You might not see it. If you do an EKG on them, you'll see that baseline disturbance. But other than that, you might not even notice it. Those two levels are OK. If you can't see it, it's fine. But if they get to the point where they're having intermittent shivering of their extremities, of their torso, that you can see, or severe shivering, which is just generalized whole body shivering that's constant, those two need to be treated aggressively. What we do is right up front, we give acetaminophen, Tylenol, you give it rectal. doesn't do anything really for the shivering, but it stops the patient's own temperature system in their brain from trying to fight you. So it makes the whole process easier. And we give them buspirone. Just serotonin agent that blunts shivering. We give that through the NG tube. Um, you know, it's an antipsychotic medicine, but it works for shivering as well. So they get that, unless they're on now inhibitors. Um, now, if they're still shivering despite those oral meds, I already told you, we have them on a fentanyl drip right up front, and that can be up titrated just for its anti shivering response, even if they seem sedated. So we start with fentanyl. We'll add on propofol if they're still shivering. Um, have you guys heard of a drug called Presidex, dexmedetomidine? All right. That's a fantastic medication as well. It kind of works like clonidine. Um, they found clonidine was sedating patients, but not stopping their respirations. Well, they created a drug that does the same thing, except it doesn't have the blood pressure lowering effects. Fantastic medication. Very, very expensive. Figure about five years from now, we'll be hearing about this drug as the standard of care for um, sedation for many of your patient populations in the ED. But that's when it gets generic. Right now, very expensive. But if you have it, fantastic blunter of shivering. And then if you've upregulated all of your sedation meds and your pain meds and they're still shivering, then you could try one dose, not continuous infusions, but one dose of a paralytic. We say Nimbex, cyst atricurium, simply because it uh, breaks down in the bloodstream without any liver or kidney involvement. But Vecuronium, which I'm sure you guys have, is fine. So just substitute Vecuronium where I wrote Nimbex, no problem. But really, it's only in extraordinary circumstances. You really should not need to paralyze these patients. But I'd rather you, if you have to, paralyze them than not be able to get them down to temp quickly. All right, you've induced them. You've given them ice saline. They're now below 34 degrees. You've gotten them to temp, but now you want to maintain them at temp. What you want to do is you want to maintain them between 32 and 34 degrees for 24 hours. Right. Now, hopefully, they'll just be an hour or two at most in your ED, and then they'll go upstairs. But you still want to maintain them during that period. Well, you have a few options. There's ice packs. They were studied by Bernard. If you have any other option, then don't take this one, because it's very difficult to control. It's messy. It's, it's not um, very tight. These patients overshoot. They get way too cold, because you can't control it. There's no on and off switch. It's just ice packs. Um, so you know they didn't have access to machines back then, but we do. I'd recommend, if you're going to do this, don't use the ice packs. The fans, they're great for heat stroke. I, again, I don't think it's a good choice for induced hypothermia. It makes a big mess. 
if they're in an ICU or the ED, you're blowing around a whole lot of microbes into these patients. Um, it's, it's annoying for the staff. You can't hear yourself talk in the room. Um, and again, there's no control. There's no way to precisely dial in where they're going. There's water circulating blankets. And let me just show you this picture because it shows really something important here. They put sheets in between the cooling blankets and the patient, and that totally ruins the effect. It, this, these blankets are made to touch the patient. They work by direct conduction. If you, you know, the, our nursing staff, when we first started, they were very diligent about making sure the patient's privacy was protected, and I understand that, and the blankets didn't work. You have to put the sheets over the blankets. So you know, put a blanket underneath the patient, put a blanket on top of the patient, put a sheet on top of it all, because these have to directly touch the skin. But if you do these right, they work very well. Um, they're a little bit uh, difficult because every time you do a procedure, you have to move them off and put them back on. But if this is what you have, and most of the HHC hospitals, they have the blank control machines and these blankets already there, you could start your protocol just with this. That's what we're still using. There's the hydrogel devices, essentially the same as cooling blankets, except they actually um, touch the skin around predominantly the thighs and torso, but they have a hydrocolloid coating. It's the same thing on your EKG electrodes, you know, that blue conductive um, jelly. Well, it could conduct electricity, you could also conduct cold, so it actually gets even a better seal to the patient's skin. Very potent, very effective, some side effects, and fairly expensive. For my money, the best device you could get is the tight wrap blankets. Same concept as the cooling blankets, except they wrap around the torso, wrap around the legs. Same general machine. They don't have the hydrocolloid. So the conduction is just from some Velcro, tightening these things around the skin. I think they have all the upsides of the hydrocolloid system without the downsides. They're relatively inexpensive. One set of blankets costs about $125. $150, depending on the manufacturer. You need to buy the initial device, unless you already have one. We already have blank controls. We just have to buy these for each patient. Very cheap, and it works. Another option is the intravascular catheters. Nothing is going to give you tighter, finer control than these. Most of them go into the femoral vein. They go up into the IVC, and they have just conductive either balloons or pieces of metal attached to the catheter that just directly cool the bloodstream. And the catheters themselves are very expensive, $1,500, depending on which manufacturer. The machines are very expensive, but wow, they'll give you very tight control. Whatever device you buy, you're now maintaining the patient 32 to 34 degrees. We're going to talk just a little bit about good post-resuscitation care aside from hypothermia. As soon as possible, get out the dirty code lines. Hypothermia does blunt the immune response. These patients are prone to ventilator-associated pneumonia. They're prone to line sepsis. So if you get the dirty lines out, if you have the time, put in clean lines. For us, in my ED intensive care area, they all get A lines in their groin, and they get um, central lines in their neck right up front. Um, you want to do lung protective ventilatory strategies. That's in the handout. Um, I'm not going to go any further into that in the interest of time. You send ABGs on these patients because the pulse ox usually will not register because their finger is too cold. In terms of sending the ABG, you don't have to tell your lab what temperature the patient's at. Just send it just like normal and manage the pH and CO2 just as if the patient was at room temp. But the, C, the uh, PaO2, on the other hand, does need to be corrected. The correction is for every degree, the patient's less than um, 37 degrees, which is essentially normal you subtract five millimeters of mercury from your PaO2. That's in your handout, but if you do it so, for instance, if a patient's 34 and their PaO2 is 80, then they're really 65, all right, because I've subtracted five for every degree below 37. And you have to send the ABGs frequently because, again, you don't have the pulse ox. Hemodynamic goals, you want to maintain these folks' MAP because that's what's going to give them cerebral perfusion. It's an injured brain post-cardiac arrest. It's low flow, it's ischemic, and it's uh, swollen. So we tell you MAP very least 65, but if you could push their MAP to 80, probably even better for cerebral perfusion pressure. And that's either with vasopressors, inotropes, or fluids. Again, good sedation, because otherwise the hypothermia effects disappear. There's a lot of electrolyte shifts with hypothermia, and these are the four that are really important. But if we had a 
put them in you know the scheme of things for what you're going to care about, it's going to look something like this. You want to optimize the magnesium. It probably has neuroprotective effects from data work that's coming out now, and it's certainly going to prevent dysrhythmias in the heart. Their mag will get higher when they rewarm, but hypermagnesemia is of no consequence when the patient's already intubated, which they will be. So feel free to optimize the magnesium to super normal levels. Um, now, the KCL, on the other hand, the, I'm sorry, the potassium, on the other hand, is an issue because when they rewarm, their potassium will get high. And that, uh, unlike magnesium, is a big problem here if they're hyperkalemic. So as a result, we tell you, correct them when they hit 3.4. So you're not correcting them to normal, super normal. You're just keeping them from getting too low. So 3.4 is the number we use. A good portion of the patient's blood pressure will depend on having normal calcium levels. So make sure you check, ionize calcium if you can. Um, it's more representative. And make sure you normalize them. And then glucose cut off at the bottom of the screen. Whole bunch of back and forth about how you should maintain tight glucose control in critically ill. Not going to go into debate. Just don't let them get super high. We cut off at 180. If you keep them below 200, you're probably doing OK. So somewhere in that range. Patients are at risk for all the standard complications a critically ill patient is. If you think about it, you have the time, you start DDT prophylaxis with some heparin, sub-Q. If not, they'll do it in the ICU. Ventilator-associated pneumonia prophylaxis, the best thing you could do is just sit the head of the bed up 30 degrees. That's all you, I mean, you've done your part if you could do that. It's a fight for me to even get my residents to do that. I mean, they just love having the patients flat. So if you sit them up to 30 degrees, you've done a benefit to the patient. Stress ulcer prophylaxis, we give them a PPI, you give them Pepsid, you give them nothing, and let the ICU do it. But again, it's, it's bonus points. It's not bonus points is getting an EKG as soon as they roll in, and then right before hypothermia. Hypothermia will give you EKG changes. You'd like to see what their baseline is beforehand. Do you folks have ultrasound in the ED? OK. If you could do an echo, even if it's just a limited echo, before you start the hypothermia, it'll give you an enormous amount of information about what the patient's heart was doing before the hypothermia. Hypothermia does have some negative chronotropic effects. It does have some small amount of negative inotropy. So seeing what the heart's doing beforehand is very nice. You also diagnose pericardial fusion. You'll diagnose um, obvious wall motion abnormalities. So if you can think about it and do it, it's great. The last part of this talk is what to do when the ice becomes unstable, when your patient is now not quite you know, doing so well, and people are screaming, oh, no, the patient's unstable. They're coming to you saying, doc, what do you want to do? And the first answer everyone has is, Exactly. Everyone's answer to that is, let's discontinue the hypothermia. At, I mean, at the, when we first started, this was everyone's solution to the patient becoming unstable. And just don't do that. Don't discontinue the hypothermia, because chances are it's not the hypothermia's fault. Let's talk about bradycardia. The bradycardia absolutely is the hypothermia's fault, but it's not a problem. 40 is the normal rate for your induced hypothermia patient. That's where they're supposed to be. And with that decrease in heart rate comes an increase in cardiac emptying. These patients, for the most part, do fine at the 40. Leave them there. Don't try to fix it. If they get much below that, then you could give agents like dobutamine. Um, in Europe, they use isopril, but that's kind of a dead drug in the States. But you can use norepi. Um, you could try to fix it if it's less than 40. But if the patient's stable and they're only showing you an isolated bradycardia, but their blood pressure is good, leave them alone. It's where they're supposed to be. Dysrhythmia is a big complaint. The patient had another episode of BFib, turn off the hypothermia. Don't do it. Until they hit 30, there's no increase in ventricular dysrhythmias from hypothermia. You're not going to get them to 30 degrees. It's not the hypothermia. Until they hit 32, there's no increase in atrial dysrhythmias, like atrial fibrillation. So if unless they're below 32, it's not the hypothermia's fault. Don't discontinue the hypothermia. Treat them just like you would ordinarily and say, oh, the reason they're in V-fit again is probably the same reason they had the cardiac arrest in the first place, and fix that. Bleeding. People are really scared of the bleeding risk of hypothermia. And there is some degree of bleeding risk, but here's the deal. Until you hit um, 35, there's no effects whatsoever. When you hit below 35, there's very small effects on the qualitative platelet dysfunction. One study just came out with resuscitation. You could reverse those platelet effects with DDAVP. So if you really thought the reason the patient's having hematuria is the hypothermia, I would not discontinue it. You could give DDAVP, or you could just leave them, because most of these effects are benign. 
Now, the coagulation cascade, which is a little more important, no effects until 33.5. So if you had a patient you were worried about, maybe they did have some oozing out of their Foley, bring them up a little bit. You're still keeping them below the threshold of 34. Bring them up to 33.5, no coagulation effects whatsoever. Even below 33.5, until you hit 32, the effects are very mild. Far less than the aspirin, heparin, 2B3As, Plavix you're going to give these patients if they turn out to have the heart as the cause of their cardiac arrest. Hemodynamic instability is the big one. All right, you get a patient, you can't get their blood pressure up, let's discontinue the hypothermia. And I would say again, wait. Ask yourself first, why are they hemodynamically unstable? Is there a reason besides the hypothermia? And usually there will be. The lung's a big reason, all right? Are you missing a PE? Was that the reason they coded? Search for it. If you do echo, look. Do you have a big right ventricle? Do you have a big right atrium? Maybe you slide down to the legs, do a DVT scan. If the patient's stable enough and you have a good pretest probability from their story, maybe even get a CT angiogram. Though it's never very much fun taking a post-cardiac arrest patient to CT. Um, but suspect the lung. If it's not the lung, it's probably the heart. Now, why would the heart be a problem? Well, before we even get into the ischemic issues, just cardiac arrest itself, when they reperfuse, leads to cardiac stunning. And this is a condition where the heart, even if it's functionally, structurally normal, will not be pumping very well immediately post-cardiac arrest. This will happen almost inevitably. Dobutamine, in a number of studies, and they're at the end of your handout, you don't need to look now, um, will reverse, to some extent, the cardiac stunning. So if they are hemodynamically unstable, you have them on norepinephrine, add dobutamine, see if they get better. Maybe even repeat the echo, see if they're um, now normal dynamic on their heart. So dobutamine, definitely a potential reverse cardiac stunning. What they might need is a balloon pump, and some centers could provide that, some centers can't. But this is a perfect patient to do it in, because the cardiac stunning only lasts about 48 hours. You know, you look at a cardiogenic shock patient, and you say, wow, you know, your standard cardiogenic shock, these patients are all going to die. I mean, the outcomes from cardiogenic shock are dismal. You know, you look at the shock trial, uh, the big trial of uh, cardiogenic shock, and very few patients survive. These are not these patients. These patients don't have a dying heart. They have a stunned heart. If you get them through the first 48 hours, they do very well. So if you could put a balloon pump in in your CCU, wow. These patients make it through the first few days. They might be off that balloon pump and doing fantastically. So it's something to consider early. Obviously, you have to have your interventionalist involved or your cardiologist, depending on who's doing your balloon pumps. Um, have not seen it as an ED therapy yet. I'm really pushing for us um, in the ED critical care world to start putting the balloon pumps in downstairs. But give me about five years, and I'll tell you how it goes. ECMO. Not recommending it, but... Two studies out of Taiwan now, where the IRB issues are a little uh, more lax, they took these patients with cardiac stunning post-cardiac arrest. The patients were absolutely impossible to maintain. Their blood pressure is 20 over 10. They put them on ECMO. They put them on cardiopulmonary bypass. The machine's doing the work for them. Two days later, weaned off the machine. Patients have normal functional hearts. It's all cardiac stunning in these patients. It's not necessarily a dead heart. So ECMO has potential. They need devices that could be easily used in the ED. They need a device where you can put a femoral A-line in, you can put a um, catheter in the femoral vein, and just hook them up to the machine. When they have machines like that and they're right on the horizon, then ECMO becomes a reality in our world, not in the you know, cardiopulmonary world where you actually have to open up the neck and get into the IJ and carotid artery. So soon, this might be an ED therapy. Not right now, but it's really just a proof of concept that if you get these patients through the first couple of days, they do well. Then the next reason to evaluate for why your patient's unstable is, are they having an ST elevation MI? And you guys are fantastic at recognizing that. We're very good in emergency medicine about diagnosing and treating this disorder, but it's especially important post-cardiac arrest. What do you do for them? They have whopping S, uh, ST elevations. Well, the nice thing to do would be to get them to the cath lab, but it's not going to happen in New York. It'll happen in Arizona, it'll happen in Pennsylvania, and why is it not going to happen in New York? That's interesting. The way New York reporting works is they just look at death. They look at the number of patients you did and the number of patients that died. Now, if you're an interventionalist, 
and you take one of these cardiac arrest patients to the lab, they have a pretty high risk of death, right? So taking these patients to the cath lab do horrible things to their reporting numbers. And now, I, I don't, you know, it's a horrible thing to say that they're, you know, looking at a patient's life based on numbers, but this is their whole livelihood. If your success rate numbers go down, they don't come to your center anymore. If you're at Lenox Hill with great numbers and you do a bunch of these cardiac arrest patients and your numbers go down, Lenox Hill doesn't get the business anymore and that hospital starts flagging. So I don't disagree with them for having their motivation. It's just a shame because these patients would benefit from this therapy. They get a separate registry for post-arrest patients. They can take these patients to the lab. If the mortality rates are high, it won't affect their normal numbers. And I think that's going to be the only way that these patients are going to get intervention. Until that point, you have to consider thrombolysis. And it's very scary. You know, AJ used to talk about CPR being a relative contraindication. We looked through all the data. It's not impressive. The ill core advisory statement from AHA and from the International Federation on Resuscitation both recommend thrombolysis post-cardiac arrest in these patients. They recommend it in conjunction with hypothermia. I have a number of studies in your handout showing it's safe. We'll look at just one of them. This is uh, over 100 patients, um, thrombolysis versus PCI. The data trended towards thrombolysis being better. I don't necessarily believe that, but I, I think you could take from this study that thrombolysis is probably as good as PCI. No complications, uh, rates different between the two. So I think this is a safe therapy. I think if you have an ST elevation MI, it's what you should do in these hypothermia patients. And I'll tell you, even if you're at a place that had a lab, and even if the lab has interventionalists that are willing to take the patients, if it's going to take them two hours to come in, I would say thrombolysis is still preferable because we know it's door to artery open time that matters. So we have thrombolyzed these patients. I would urge you to do the same. So to review, hypothermia, proven, it has face validity, and yet no one's doing it. So please, do it. I'd say induce with saline in anyone, no matter which device you buy. You maintain them for 24 hours with whatever gadget you want to purchase. Don't stop, even if they're unstable. Chances are it's not the hypothermia. Early revascularization for your ST elevation MIs. And because of cardiac stunning, if you get them through the first 48 hours, things can get much, much better. So don't give up if the patient looks really sick when they first hit the door. All right, I'd love to take any questions. Thank you so much for your attention.